Okay, good afternoon again. Um, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. This is the second year I've been here. Um, I, it took me all year to convince Bapu to invite me back, so I don't know if I'll be able to do it again next year. Um, but I'm going to try. Um, I might work on Dominique for my, set, my third trip to India, which I, which I absolutely love. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the organizers of the, of the conference. It's just uh, they've been uh, incredible as far as helping everything run smoothly from a presenter perspective. Um, and I haven't seen any complaints. Even though I tried to get them as part of my workshop, um, I had a persona exercise where the persona was a conference attendee. And part of the exercise was to uh, embody that person and, and complain about the conference experience. So there was very little um, for them to complain about. And I, I applaud them um, for the work that they've done. Um, I also want to uh, echo something that Sarah mentioned um, and, you know, uh, again, applaud Bapu and the organizers. Um, I'm going to cover some of the things that have been spoken about by Liam and by Sarah um, and by Mark, but um, I'm going to be very tactical. Um, this is not going to be so much of an inspirational talk, and uh, it's not going to be um, as broad in, in its scope and reach as some of the others as far as uh, affecting change in our organizations. Um, but um, it's going to be very practical, um, very tactical. So a little bit about me, as, we, as we've mentioned, uh, my name's Ray Delapena. I'm the Director of Strategy at Catalyst Group in New York. Um, we're a consultancy, and uh, I've been a consultant for most of my career, except for a small stretch where I was in-house. Um, and I've mostly worked for large organizations. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, trying to embed and affect change in those organizations, uh, particularly from the perspective of Lean UX. So the goal of the talk today, the, the specific topic here, is how we can introduce a lean methodology in a large or an enterprise organization. Um, you know, it's very similar to that sort of that diagram that Liam showed about in, uh, the uh, innovation influence coming into the cell and, and growing. Um, and it's also in line with, with what Sarah just described about how to affect change in the culture. Um, but you know, I've attended conferences for, for many years. Um, I remember actually one of the first talks I heard in UX was a talk by Mark, which was very inspiring um, about sort of the effect that interaction design can have on the world. And I just wanted to go out and save the world. Um, and then I had to go back and design uh, a data entry forms um, and redesign home pages. And you know, that, that push and pull is very difficult, um, particularly when we hear these amazing and inspiring talks uh, at conferences, and we want to go back to our organization and implement some of these things, but we're constricted by um, the tasks that we're given um, and the sort of uh, constraints within our organizations. So what I'm going to talk about today is just one example of how we either as an individual consultant um, or as an individual team of one in an organization, in a large organization, um, I've, can sort of sneak in, you know, cross that threshold um, and introduce a methodology um, that we're now calling Lean, but I've had many conversations with, with many people here and other places about how Lean UX is just what we're calling good design now. Um, we're focusing a little bit on some aspects of the design process um, as Lean, um, but they're really just good design. And this is a way for us to inject a good design process into an organization um, with a lot of constraints. So, a couple of terms first. The, the, the title of the talk is MVPOC. And you're going to forgive me for introducing a new acronym. I don't want you to use it. Um, but I'll define a couple of terms first. So an MVP, a lot of uh, confusion about what this term is. And for the purpose of this talk, um, it stands for minimum viable product, um, which has been used in many ways. It's used in agile uh, methodology or terminology as well, and uh, more recently and frequently in lean uh, methodology. It's a minimal version of a proposed solution, um, particularly as we think about a proof of concept context. Um, the idea here is that we're going to learn from customers by measuring the effects of or the uh, outcomes from releasing this product into their, into their world. Uh, it ensures that a solution meets a need. So that's one of the uh, focuses that uh, Lean UX emphasizes, is that there's uh, a connection between the, uh, the products that we, we provide to users and the actual uh, needs that they're fulfilling. Um, and it's used to repeat, uh, used as a vehicle to repeat this process, this loop um, that at every Lean conference you see one time or another. Um, and this cycle of, of thinking or doing some analysis, making something, a product or a prototype or a test, 
checking the performance of that, of that product in the real world with users, um, either in the form of a sort of simulated uh, test or by actually releasing it into the market, and then measuring those results and thinking about how to iterate your product in response to that. So the MVP in this context is the, the artifact, the product or the, or the prototype in most cases that's used to get through this cycle. So what is the proof of concept? Um, I know you've been asked a few times already, and I know a, a large portion of the audience works at large organizations. Um, and during my workshop, I asked uh, how many people are involved in uh, creating new ideas or um, being responsible for the creation of new products in their organizations, and how many have worked on uh, the proof of concept. So I'll just define what I mean by that. Um, there's a sort of list of attributes that are common among proof of concepts, and those are that they contain a list of functional requirements. Right? The purpose of the proof of concept is to obtain funding, typically, um, to go ahead and design and build a, a full product. Um, they usually follow some sort of a marketing uh, report or some analysis that says there's an opportunity in the market or some need, um, and we want to try to fill that need or we want to try to get a piece of that market to increase our uh, influence or our revenue or the service that we provide to our customers. So there's a list of functional requirements there are development estimates. What is this going to cost us to build? What's the investment we need to make? Um, there's some initial designs. You know, we have to visualize this thing um, in order to test it, evaluate it, in order to um, sort of get that approval to move forward and, and design and build the thing. And ultimately, there are typically also some performance projections, um, usually in the form of financial projections, but that could be in the form of the market share we expect to uh, gain by introducing this new product or the revenue increases we expect. Um, or the new sets of, uh, types of features that we hope to uh, release. So you mash them up and you get this MVPOC, Minimum Viable Proof of Concept. And I say, you know, don't really use this term. I'm, I'm using it a, a bit tongue-in-cheek. Um, and again, going back to this idea that, you know, is lean all that different than agile, all that different than good design? Not really. But if there's interest around the way we're marketing or talking about doing good design, or talking about it in one way or another or, uh, in, in, in these terms allows us to focus on aspects of doing design well, then I'm, I'm happy to, to call it whatever we like. Um, and the reason this, uh, this term has been sort of a successful um, internally in our organization to uh, sort of infiltrate um, enterprise groups with this lean methodology um, is because there tend to be fewer restrictions on the creation of a proof of concept in a large organization than there are in uh, the, the full development life cycle or the product release life cycle um, in enterprises. So the MVPOC is this sort of canned approach that will allow us to uh, inject a bit of innovation um, and a bit of uh, positive change into the design processes. So the next thing I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is go through essentially a traditional design project phase, uh, each phase of the design project, starting with the initiation of a design project. Um, we always want to establish what are the goals of our project. And in the case of a, of a proof of concept, um, we obviously have to create a proof of concept that contains all those elements that I just outlined a few moments ago. Um, we also usually end up with a product roadmap, which means that the entire set of uh, features and functions that we want to include in this new product will probably not be in the initial release. Um, especially as we're designing uh, what we think it should or could be. Um, there's going to be some constraints that say we're going to have to start off with a subset of all of our features and then uh, map out how the rest of them will be implemented or how the product may grow. And finally, we want a validated product. Typically, that means it's feasible to build. Um, ideally, that people will want it. Um, and I'll talk about the differences um, in accomplishing these goals when we do it this way as opposed to the traditional way. So, to embark on a project like this, um, from my perspective, it's usually as a consultant, um, and this is where I'm putting together my proposal. Um, when I propose a project to a client, either in response to an RFP or just through our, our uh, connections with our existing clients, you know, I'm aware that there's a new uh, concept that a company wants to build and they come to us for design and research assistance and strategy assistance. Um, first, I need to get buy-in on this methodology. You know, we often uh, approach them and offer them sort of two options. We could do it the regular way, the old-fashioned way, or we could do it this new way. 
Um, and we talk about uh, the pros and cons of doing it either way. So we need to get buy-in on the, on the process and on the methodology. Um, we need to put together the right team. Now, this is one of the other uh, key aspects that differentiates lean, um, or I should say good design, um, from the way things are traditionally done um, in organizations where we want to improve things. And then establishing the process we're going to use for this, uh, for this particular project. Uh, even though I'm going to give you almost a step-by-step -step recipe, I, I don't encourage you to, to, to follow it as dogma. It's just an example of the approach that we've seen be effective um, and I hope you know, potentially could be a, a template for you to uh, start from and, and modify as is good for your, uh, for your situation. So in order to get buy-in, um, one of the first things we need, need to be able to do is understand what the objections may be to, to convincing the stakeholders or the decision makers to try what we want to try. Um, so that has to do with uh, understanding the potential risks that they may feel are inhibiting them from trying this method. Um, we need to work within organizational constraints. So we know that in large organizations, there are a lot of them. We're not going to try to go around them. Um, we won't risk the uh, relationships and reputation that already exist. There are existing products um, and sales that um, we know that, uh, especially working in a lean methodology where we say, well, let's just put something in the market and see how customers react. Um, that's a, a big red flag um, to organizations with established products and services. Um, and key, almost most important, is we'll work within the established budget. You know, we'll do what uh, uh, the work that we need to do in this new way for the same cost that we've uh, got available to us in doing it in the old way. But what are the rewards of doing this? Well, first, we've got a customer-validated concept. Right? We're going to be uh, presenting these proofs of concept to our customers in a controlled or simulated way um, versus releasing them to the market. So we'll have information on the performance that we can expect in the real market from our customers. And we'll have a more informed roadmap, so we'll have a better understanding of what works and when and uh, what we need to iterate a bit more as the product is released and rolled out. Um, there'll be less risk that there'll be sort of an utter disconnect between our market and our ideas. Um, and almost as a byproduct, we'll have a better understanding of our customers um, based on the team that we have and the methods that we've used. And key, as we've talked about sort of as uh, in infiltrating a new methodology, we'll have a repeatable process that we can either continue to use for proofs of concept or we can sort of begin to influence the actual product uh, development life cycle um, and by demonstrating its effectiveness in this uh, more isolated arena. So speaking of the team, um, we've talked a lot about, I've talked to engineers, I've talked to designers, I've talked to people who are not necessarily even involved in uh, the product development life cycle, but the roles that I like to bring together for a project like this and that are typically involved in uh, lean methodology include those from the business, design, development, and customers. Um, and within the business, uh, I like to consider the sort of the stakeholder as part of that, as well as the product owner and the domain expert. So the team that is involved in this project from start to finish includes all of these roles. And the value of that is the collaboration um, and the input from all those roles at every stage, um, which sort of facilitates um, a shared ownership of the project, of the product, um, and a shared understanding of the uh, challenges faced by all of those roles, as well as the customer's uh, point of view and what works and what doesn't work for them. So how do we do this? This is, as I said, a fairly traditional progression of activities. Um, we're going to do a period of discovery where we need to understand the business and the customers. There's going to be a period where we ideate, where we create concepts to address the needs, and then we'll validate them. Um, we'll, do, we'll make sure that those needs are addressing uh, the goals that we've set out for the project, and ultimately we'll iterate. Um, for the purposes of this, this formula, this uh, MVPOC approach, we recommend that we iterate three times, and we'll talk about why, um, to validate and refine. Once again, even if you're a UX team of one, handed a list of requirements to create some wireframes with no other input, you go through all of these activities, even if only in your head. You have to understand the context around which you're designing. You have to create concepts and you have to understand the users. And the validation in most cases has to do with presenting it to stakeholders and getting their feedback and responding to that. And that's what we tend to iterate on. But hopefully, um, with this methodology, we'll be able to expand on that and involve customers. So again, going back to the lean cycle, um, 
entering into that cycle, a, a phase that's not often talked about in the, in the literature, um, we add sort of a look. Um, and those four phases that I describe to me are about the transition to or the overlap between these the sort of main bubbles of, of the diagram. So during discovery, we're looking and tra transitioning into the thinking part. Um, and when we ideate, we're, we're sort of transitioning from thinking to making. Um, and then making and checking is the validation. What we need to make and how we need to check it um, is part of that transition and that path. And the iteration has to do with receiving the output or the results of our check and understanding how to process and synthesize that to repeat the cycle. So the first phase of the actual work, assuming we've got buy-in um, and we're going to, to embark down this path, is the discovery. So this is where we look and think. Um, and this consists of three important parts, equally important parts, which are to understand the business, understand the customer, and understand how the product serves both. Um, you know, user-centered design, um, you know, so this, the uh, importance of understanding users sometimes, at least in our discussion, obscures the importance of understanding the business and understanding the other half of that relationship um, uh, between a customer and a business and the products and services that they provide. So I think it's equally important to understand the business as well as how the product will serve both. And we need to design products that are beneficial to both the customer and the business to keep that relationship growing and moving forward. I've seen lots of numbers flying around, but I hope they're not. OK. <laughs> um, so where do we start? So understanding the business has to do with uh, several aspects. We have to understand the domain. We have to understand if we're in finance, we have to understand finance a bit. If we're in healthcare, we need to understand healthcare a bit. Um, this is one of the things I love about being a consultant is I get the opportunity to sort of delve into and understand new business domains. But even as an in-house employee at a large corporation, you, know, you, you only are benefited by understanding the domain in which your business works. Um, you need to understand the existing products and services that your company provides. Um, if only to see where this one will fit in and how they may, it may complement um, or overlap with others. You need to establish the goals of the business. Um, and I say establish, I use this term quite a few times because they may already exist, but you want to sort of codify and make them clear and make sure everyone is on the same page. And if they don't exist, you want to make sure that um, you know, you, we create them or we agree that we've got some specific goals that we want to attain. And we need to understand existing or previous strategies. Yeah, there, if there's an existing product organization, as we're talking about in this context, there's been some thinking about how, uh, how we can succeed or continue to succeed. Um, so we need to understand that to determine whether we should continue with that strategy or adjust it or create one if there's none uh, that's apparent. And finally, uh, we want to be able to measure you know, so we need to define or analyze metrics that will help inform whether or not we're doing a good job. Um, this is one thing that's, that's key to the Lean methodology, and again, as I keep saying, to good design in general. Um, but you know, in Lean, uh, there are a few aspects of uh, measurement and how we conduct experiments that are just sort of being uh, brought to the focus, and that's why uh, I continue to use that term. Um, it's the new hotness, as, uh, uh, as Liam mentioned, in California and also uh, here and, and around the world. Um, as far as understanding our customers, um, there's probably some existing understanding of our customers, even if only in the form of assumptions that we make. Um, so I think during the discovery process, it, it's important for us to start off with exposing that, uh, those assumptions. Um, so that's why I always like to start off with a proto or a provisional persona that gets, again, keep in mind that uh, these exercises include the entire team business, development, marketing, et cetera. So we want to expose as a group what is our current understanding of customers. Um, and these will be uh, built upon, 10? Oh my god. These will be built upon uh, as, we, as we continue to uh, research and develop our products. Um, there's a presumed life cycle, so how quickly do uh, customers go from sort of an understanding um, and then uh, using and uh, being advocates of our product. And then uh, we want to perform some research, whatever our budget allows, if it's generative or analysts, uh, analysis of uh, existing history with customers. We want to make sure that our understanding is correct. And we want to understand how our relationship might work. What is the journey um, that we expect our customers to go through with our business and with this product, um, which typically goes through these stages of awareness, evaluation, acquisition, support, and retention. Um, 
So now moving into the uh, ideation phase. Um, for this method, I, I like to rely on a design studio uh, technique that um, Will Evans, who was supposed to be here, um, could have talked a lot more about than I can. Um, and Todd Zaki Waffle, you can research this technique. But um, it essentially brings together all of these roles in a collaborative ideation uh, session where we sketch and critique and share ideas in uh, a number of rounds. And we, and we create concepts as a group involving customers. Um, the reason I choose this methodology is because it brings together all these roles, it creates a volume of ideas, and it evolves the team's understanding of customers and their perspectives um, as, we, as we generate those ideas. Um, when you're doing this in this context, we want to also use this as a discovery activity um, where we sort of evolve our understanding of the personas and of the scenarios, have a discussion uh, with and between customers, um, and expose the rest of the team to that discussion. So we really get a better sense of how customers feel about the product um, and about our, our services. And then finally, this is where Lean sort of flexes its muscles or uh, what it puts at the forefront, and that is in the validation phase. Um, how do we make and check the assumptions we're making and the products that we're hoping to put into the market? Um, and that has to do with identifying those assumptions and making them explicit um, about the business and about the customer, and then creating our, our initial versions of the product in the, in the form of an experiment, um, which means uh, creating hypotheses from our assumptions, building a prototype based on the objective of testing them against those hypotheses, and then conducting a, a formal and structured test. Um, and that could be field research, that could be paper prototypes, but we definitely want to use uh, best practices and a somewhat rigorous approach to who we test and how we test. Um, so that we can rely on our observations and, and utilize them. So to identify ad uh, assumptions, there's sort of these three parts. There's coming up with a problem statement, um, there's clarifying our business assumptions, and clarifying, once again, our customer assumptions. Um, this section, uh, all of you can uh, talk to, to a lot of you who are reading uh, the Lean UX book, and Jeff Gotthelf and uh, Josh Seiden have done a great job in sort of codifying um, how these lean practices can be applied uh, in a UX context. So a lot of this comes from a section of the book that's uh, referred to in the slides from my workshop in particular. Um, but this is sort of a template um, to expose the general problem statement that the business has and it hopes to solve by, uh, by the initiative that you're sort of addressing uh, with this design project. But it can also be used to describe the problem that the business uh, proposes to solve in general. You know, and it's got this format of why the business was created what goals it was uh, created to achieve, and then what the problems are that it's perceived that, uh, where it's not meeting those goals, and what it thinks the adverse effects are on the business, and how we might improve the service um, to uh, more successfully meet the needs of both the customers and the business. Um, moving to how the business will succeed, this is where we try to decide what are the assumptions we're making about our customer. Um, so what are the match between our capabilities and their needs? Um, you know, how will we generate revenue for the business based on these products? And how do we compare to uh, the competition that we face in the market? And what are the biggest risks as a business? Uh, and moving into the customer understanding, most of this will already be represented by our persona and our journey mapping. Um, but again, to go through the exercise of calling out those assumptions and uh, clarifying what we know about our customers, their needs, the most important features that we can give them um, and how the product should be designed from a look and feel perspective. Um, these are the things that we want to, once again, call out and be clear about the assumptions we're making about all of these entities. Given all that, we take our assumptions and we want to now convert them into a hypothesis, which is that we believe the, sort of the first two bullets, the left bullets, can be used to create the hypothesis for the business in general. Right? We believe that our business does the following things and we'll know we're right or wrong when we make the following observations. Um, the second level in are uh, what are referred to as the sub-hypotheses um, in the Lean UX uh, lexicon. Um, and that's more about, we believe these particular features and functions will serve these particular customers um, to achieve these specific outcomes. And we'll know we're right or wrong when we, when we see these measurable results. These, these sub-hypotheses are the things that we use to essentially build the requirements for our prototype or for our MVP so that we can conduct our experiment. So given those hypotheses and given those sub-hypotheses, 
Um, we then create the prototype, which will uh, determine which features for which target personas will achieve which expected outcomes. And then we only build, or we build only, <laughs> what's necessary to test these hypotheses. That's the M part of the MVP. And then we conduct a test. Um, there's another aspect of this lean uh, sort of terminology called GOOB that a lot of us has heard, which stands for get out of the building. I um, mean, the idea there is that you know, you're not going to be successful designing your solutions sort of in a bubble or within the walls of your organization or within your group. So the idea is get out of the building, interact with your customers, um, and find out from them what works and what doesn't. Sometimes that can go too far um, when the, the idea is have your whole team involved, which is great, um, but, but we found that sometimes bad research can be better than, uh, worse than no research. So what we want to do is recruit properly. Um, and this is one of the roles that our persona helps us fill. Um, we've defined some attributes and some needs um, and some uh, potential solutions for a particular group of people. So that's what's going to guide who we recruit and who we engage with when we conduct these tests. Um, record thoroughly. Um, so make sure that we're uh, capturing the results of the interview as it happens. Typically, we do this with uh, two people conducting interviews and one recording only and the other facilitating. Um, and then repeat or be prepared to repeat this process. Um, if we're going to do this in an iterative way, you'll find that the first few times you're conducting research, um, it's, it's a scramble um, to have the equipment and the procedures and the sort of uh, approach um, to getting out and recruiting and conducting and synthesizing research um, is something you get better at over time. So when you prepare to do this, um, be prepared to repeat it and be focused on the activity as something that you want to uh, evolve as well as just getting to the results. And finally, iterate, um, you know, repeat the process. And I say uh, check and think three times. So for this process, I say three times. And the reason I choose three um, is, first of all, we found that three rounds of iteration, which we typically do in two-week cycles, um, usually fits in with the budget that we tend to have or see uh, for MVPs or for POCs. Um, and the reason three works is that the first time, it's your, it's your first opportunity. You've created some concepts. You've done all this research and thinking. It's the first time you're going to see how your customers react. So obviously, we need to do it that first time. The second time, once you've synthesized that, is your first opportunity to see how your reactions play out. How well did you understand what they did? And how well do your adjustments work? And then that third time is the opportunity for you, based on those reactions, you may need to pivot. You may need to do things entirely differently. Or you may need to, uh, that may be your opportunity to iterate and improve on your, on your uh, MVP uh, POC, your MVPOC, your concept. So, you know, obviously, once again, do as many of these rounds as you can. But if you can get to three, you'll either have been able to perform a pivot um, and you'll have some validation of, you know, that you're on the right track, you've made an adjustment, or you'll have had two rounds of improvement to a product given uh, your first reaction to customers. Now, if you've gotten through three rounds and you still are getting a bad reaction, well, then you might need to rethink the concept or rethink the initiative. Um, and if you can get a budget for more of these or get approval for more of these, then, then all the better. But that's why we choose three. So at the end of this process, what have we done? Right? We've validated our product idea. We've got a proof of concept that has been presented to our users or our customers, has been validated more than once. We've been able to adjust and hopefully improve um, we've created a team-wide understanding about the product, the customers, and the fit between all of them. Um, we've got now probably buy-in from developers, from the business, because they've been exposed to all these activities. And most importantly, we've established this methodology. Um, when I've done this with groups um, in large organizations, they've been shocked that, you know, why don't we do this for, for every project? Um, they've been amazed at, um, first of all, how wrong they could be after that first shot against the clients. You know, um, we've got a great idea. We've spent a long time in marketing and in the business thinking about it and designing it. And we put it in front of people, and they don't get it, or they don't need it, or they don't want it. So when we were doing this methodology of having three rounds to adjust to that, to adapt to that, and we've gotten to a place where now customers didn't get it, but there was some nugget of what they would want, we did a little bit of an adjustment, and said, OK, we think this is what you guys want. They said, yes, this is what we want. And then one round of iteration, customers are now excited about the possibility of this new product. You've got a, uh, a stronger argument to be made when you present this proof of concept for approval. 
and you've got buy-in from everyone involved in the team as well as um, in, the, in the product and in the process. So ultimately, um, this is one way that we've found to sort of cross that threshold, introduce a seed of innovation that hopefully can sprout uh, into a uh, sort of methodology that can grow and uh, a way to do good design, if you call it lean or you call it whatever you like, a way to do good design in your organizations. Um, what comes next, typically, establish those metrics that will drive the product forward, scope that initial release, and then repeat with buy-in from the company and buy-in from your customers. Thanks. Not too bad on time. Second one.